Welcome to South Park City Museum. We're located in Fair Play, Colorado at an elevation of almost 10,000 feet above sea level. My name is Bob Dragonfly and I'll be your host today. I'm so glad you came to visit us. There's a lot to see through these doors. 43 buildings and almost 60,000 artifacts and two cats named Thelma and Louise. Let's take a look around the Visitor Center before we get our tickets. There are some exhibits here and they'll give us a taste of what's inside. Look at this. Uh, this is a 3D model of the South Platte dredge. Do you know what a dredge was used for? A dredge was a floating factory that scooped up huge amounts of dirt and rocks out of a pond, then it ran the material through a processing plant inside. What do you think they were looking for? Gold! And boy, did they find it. The South Platte dredge pulled millions of dollars worth of gold out of the ground in just a few years. Gold isn't the only thing that was mined up here. Do you know what this is? I'll give you a hint. It's the official mineral of Colorado. It's rhodochrosite. Isn't it pretty? It, and it's very rare. Colorado is one of the only places in the world where well-formed crystals like this are formed. One of those places isn't far from South Park City. It's called Sweet Home Mine, and it's near Alma, Colorado. Gold mining is a huge part of Colorado's history, and we'll learn more about that later on in our visit. Are you ready to head into the museum? Okay, let's go get our tickets. We're all set, let's head on out. Take a look at this. This is a whole town just like it would have been in the 1800s. You know, it feels a bit like time travel, but I'm not really dressed for the part, let's see. Now that's more like it. They say that clothes make the man, right? Well, what, do you, what about you? If you lived here in the 1800s, what kind of clothes would you wear? What would your school be like? What would you do every day? Let's head over to the schoolhouse and find out. Welcome to South Park City School, class of 1880. Take a look around. Where's the rest of it, you ask? Well, this is it. This is known as a one-room schoolhouse. Kids from kindergarten to high school all learn from the same room with the same teacher. The teacher had to be able to teach students of every level all at the same time. To become a teacher, a person didn't have to go through special training like your teacher did. They only had to know how to read, write, and they had to be able to handle all of the students at once. Younger kids would sit in the front where the teacher could keep an eye on them. Older kids, who could be trusted to work on their own, sat towards the back. Most teachers during this period in the time were men, and they were called schoolmasters. Women were sometimes allowed to be teachers, but they had to be single. Once a woman got married, she wasn't allowed to teach anymore. Does that seem fair to you? Don't worry, later on in the early 1900s, it was more acceptable for women to be teachers. Not all towns had schools, so kids would learn to read and write at home, or at a neighbor's house. Or if the schoolhouse was close enough, students would have to walk several miles to school and back home again at the end of the day. School was very different over 140 years ago, wasn't it? Do you think that learning in the same room with students of all ages would have been difficult? What other differences have you noticed so far? Since teachers had so much to do back then, most of them only had time to teach three subjects. These subjects were the, known as the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. 
first came reading. Being able to read was just as important for people in the 1800s as it is for us now. Imagine living way back then before TV was invented. Families would sit around the fire after dinner and read to each other from books, newspapers, and even catalogs. Written communication, especially when you lived way up in the mountains of Colorado, was very important. Telephones had not been invented yet, so the mail was the only way to communicate with the rest of the world. Who would you write to back then? Last but not least came arithmetic, and or, or as we call it now, math. Do you think that calculators were around in the 1880s? You guessed it, they weren't. So math was done the hard way, by hand. And then this is called an abacus. An abacus was used to calculate large numbers. It was sometimes also called a counting frame and has been used since ancient times. So how did kids of all ages learn the three R's? Paper wasn't always available. And when it was, it was expensive. So students used slates. Slates were a little like small chalkboards. You could practice your handwriting skills or penmanship as it was called back then, and once your teacher checked your work, you could erase it and move on to the next lesson. Memorization was a big part of learning. In a one-room schoolhouse, it was called learning by rote. This meant that you would have to be memorizing long poems or stories and recite them in front of the whole class. Sometimes you would be required to write essays or speeches, then memorize them and recite them. Whew, that sounds like a lot of work. What do you think? Could you memorize a whole essay? Arithmetic was learned the same way. You would have to memorize the times tables and recite them for the class. Nine times one is nine. Nine times two is 18. Nine times three is 27. Or students would be drilled in math. You would have to do equations in your head and give the correct answer to your teacher. Quick, what's nine times nine? In school, students were expected to dress well, be clean, and be on their best behavior. Girls had to wear dresses, and if they could afford them, pinafores, which were like an apron. They helped keep the girls' dresses clean. Boys were expected to wear long pants and button-up shirts. Each morning, students lined up at the door to the school in order of their age, and as they went into the school, they were expected to greet the teacher respectfully. Girls were to curtsy, and boys had to bow to show their good manners. They did have recess between lessons and after lunch. Students were allowed outside to play schoolyard games like tag, jump rope, or hide and seek. They might have been the only time during the day that the kids were allowed to play. They were responsible for chores at home before and after school as well. Once recess was over, it was back to work. I'll bet you have recess too. What other similarities have you noticed? Kids had to help the teachers keep the classroom clean and warm. Winters up here in Fair Play got very cold, so the wood stove had to be stocked with wood to keep the fire going. This one stove would have to heat the whole room. Students also had to help wash the blackboard at the end of the day. They would collect the slates and books and put them away neatly where they belonged. Do you help your teacher clean up your classroom too? Life as a student in a single classroom was pretty different, wasn't it? Why do you think people who had already settled cities on the eastern side of the United States decided to come way up here in the mountains? Winters can be eight months long up here and there's an average of 12 feet of snow a year. Why would people have never lived in the area before want to settle here permanently? The area around Fair Play where this museum is located is called South Park. It's about 500 square miles of high mountains and plains. For thousands of years, it was uninhabited during the winter. The Ute and Arapaho migrated to South Park in the summer to hunt, fish, and gather salt from the natural salt deposits in the area. Then when the leaves started to change, they left for the winter. They headed back down to the lower elevations and spent the winter where it didn't get as cold and there wasn't so much snow. 
Pretty smart, wouldn't you say? So what was it that brought non-native people up here to live year-round in the first place? Let me give you a hint. What do you think? Any ideas yet? Okay, I'll give you another hint. There's someone I want you to meet. This is Sylvester. He's a beaver. Or once upon a time, he was a beaver. And now he's been stuffed and mounted so that people who visit this part of the museum can see a beaver in his natural habitat without disturbing Sylvester's ancestors out in the wild. How do you think that this critter brought a whole lot of people to the Western United States? When Europeans came to North America, there were beaver in almost every part of the country. Where there were streams or creeks, there were beavers. Imagine that. How many little streams or creeks do you think there are in the United States? A whole lot, right? Now imagine that all the beaver that lived here, what happened to them? And what does this little guy have to do with people showing up here? Let's find out. This is a beaver pelt, which is another name for an animal's skin or fur. Take a look at how shiny and thick it is. A beaver's fur is really good at keeping them warm and dry. Beavers spend a lot of time around water chewing on trees to harvest the wood for building their dams. In the winter, a beaver's coat is very thick. It's very soft and a pretty color too. Some Native American cultures hunted beaver for food. They would also use their fur and clothing and even their bones for tools. The Native Americans didn't overhunt the beaver, so the beaver kept thriving across the country. Then from the year 1800 to about 1840 or so, beaver became so fashionable that people in cities as far away as Europe started to make fancy hats and clothes out of the beaver fur. Since it wasn't fashion, everyone wanted a beaver hat or coat for themselves. Because beaver fur was in high demand, it meant that people could make a good deal of money trapping beaver way up here in the mountains and selling it to companies that made hats and other fashionable items. Since the beaver's fur was thickest in the winter, fur trappers would try to hunt them as close to winter months as they could. If the snow was too deep, they would have to wait until spring. Trappers had to go to wild and isolated places like way up here in South Park to trap animals with valuable fur. They didn't just trap beaver. They could sell the pelts of fox, wolves, raccoon, and otter too. They built small cabins where they could to stay warm enough through the harsh winter months. Most of these trappers' cabins were just one room which held everything they needed to survive in the wilderness. A bed, a fireplace, a small table and chair, cooking equipment, and a place to store all of their traps and hunting gear. Trappers would wear the furs of the animals they caught and eat their meat to survive. They would go many long months without seeing another human being. Do you think that would be a lonely way to live? What do you think about living way up in the mountains by yourself? Imagine how quiet it would have been with no other people around. Fur trappers hunted so many beavers that it became difficult to find them anymore. Because they were hard to find, the fur became even more valuable and would only be used in very expensive items such as collars, muffs, and trimmings and other clothes. Then in the late 1840s, fashion changed as it does, and the expensive, hard-to-find beaver pelts fell out of fashion, and they were replaced by silk. Suddenly, all of those fancy beaver hats weren't popular anymore, and people really wanted silk hats. So that was the end of the beaver trade. A lot of damage had been done to the beaver population. The beaver had nearly gone extinct. Luckily, beavers are really good at building strong homes to keep their families safe, and they didn't die out. You can see beaver ponds up here near Fairplay. The end didn't stop people from coming out west. The demand for beaver led to exploration of the western part of the United States. People saw the west as an opportunity to make new lives for themselves and maybe strike it rich. But I'm getting hot in all this fur. Let's see. Whew, that's better. Now let's go look for some gold. Prospectors had arrived by the hundreds in Terriol, the place where some of the first gold strikes were. As more miners arrived, there was no more room in Terriol, and the newcomers were sent packing. This didn't seem fair to those miners, so that when they founded this place, they called it Fair Play, meaning that everyone would have a fair shot at striking gold. 
fair play and new mining towns like it were called boom towns because they grew very suddenly and very fast due to the gold being mined nearby. So, not long after the prospectors showed up looking for gold, other people started arriving with ideas of getting rich in other ways. Can you think of other ways that the old timers made lots of money in those early days of the gold rush? Well, let's think about it. Well, miners needed things, right? They need food, tools, burrows, and entertainment. They wanted to spend that gold that they were finding. So that's where merchants showed up. They opened general stores to sell food and supplies to the miners. They opened blacksmith shops to fix the miners' tools when they broke. In 1859, gold was discovered in South Park. Word spread fast, and before you knew it, thousands of people were arriving here ready to take their chances at striking it rich. The town of Fairplay was founded that very year. They opened stables for horses and barbershops, hotels, laundries, and saloons, just about any service you can think of, open for business to cash in on the gold that was being mined by thousands of people. Most of the mining done here at the time was placer mining. That's when the gold is loose in the sand, rock, and gravel near rivers and streams. Miners would use gold pans and sluices and the power of water pressure to separate the gold from the river banks. What was left over is called tailings. You can still see huge piles of rocks along the rivers to this day. 10,000 miners sure made a lot of piles of rock, didn't they? The next year, in 1860, was a census year. It was recorded that there were over 22,000 miners in Colorado. Half of those miners were located right here in South Park alone. That's more people that live here today. It must have been a sight to see. So the miners came to South Park looking for gold. They were followed by entrepreneurs and eventually by their families. All of those people heading to Colorado at once certainly made an impact. For generations, the Cheyenne, Lakota, and Kiowa lived on the plains, while Ute and Arapaho tribes lived at higher altitudes. And when the miners came in looking for gold in the thousands, they completely disrupted the Native American way of life. The newcomers hunted the buffalo and mountain goats until they were almost extinct. They cut down the trees to build their boom towns, which changed the local ecosystems. When the Ute and Arapaho tribes arrived at their summer hunting grounds, they found it occupied by mining camps as far as the eye could see. How do you think that this impacted the Native American way of life? The gold being found in Colorado quickly got the attention of the U.S. government. It was the reason that the U.S. decided to create the Colorado Territory in 1861. The balance of power then shifted in Colorado in favor of the United States government. It also marked the beginning of the decline of the Ute people in Colorado. The U.S. government was concerned with protecting mining interests after 1859 by taking Ute territory through a series of treaties. By 1880, the Utes had been forced to leave most of the Rockies in western Colorado, which had been their homeland for centuries in a span of just over 20 years. As time went on, some of the mining boom towns were abandoned after all the gold was gone. Some of them, like Fairplay, continued to thrive. The railroad arrived and the newcomers stayed. There are still active gold mines in South Park today. Once the mining was taken over by big companies and individual mining claims became less common, the West was seen as a land of opportunity and a whole new group of people from the eastern United States headed up here looking for new lives. This new group of people was called, oh, wait a minute. Whew, much better. Mining is dusty work. Okay, follow me. Will you look at this beauty? This is called a covered wagon. Colorado was about to see a whole lot of these in this point in history. After the U.S. government became interested in Colorado because of all the gold to be found here, it started pushing native tribes out of the area. After that, the land, according to the politicians in Washington, was up for grabs. The Homestead Act of 1862 offered any American, including freed slaves, to put in a claim for up to 160 acres of federal land. Aside from a small processing fee, the land was free of charge for those willing to travel west to claim it. Since Colorado became a territory of the United States the year before, this meant that homesteaders could, according to Washington, claim land up here. Farmers and ranchers were some of the groups to take advantage of the Homestead Act, and they headed for Colorado. Even here, high up in the mountains, the homesteaders made their homes. Records show that in Colorado, between 1868 and 1961, 107,618 successful land entries resulted in 22,246,400 acres of land being claimed by homesteaders. That's a lot of people and a lot of land, isn't it?
Imagine that many people heading to Colorado in a short period of time. Can you think of ways that this would have changed things up here in the mountains? What about the new homesteaders? How do you think the life changed for them in their new homes? Can you imagine fitting everything you own in a covered wagon? There's not a lot of room in here for lots of furniture or belongings. What would you want to bring with you to start a whole new life in a strange place? Let's go and take a look at what a homesteading family's house might have looked like. This small home is what many homesteaders would have lived in in their first years on their new land. Depending on the availability of wood and things like nails and tools to build, these original tiny homes might have been built like this one. The settlers up here in South Park had lots of trees for lumber, so when they arrived, they got to work building their new homes. Now, things like window glass, nails, or other hardware were luxury items. Sometimes families would bring these things all the way from the east with them in their covered wagons. This meant that the windows were covered with fabric to keep the wind and rain out. Can you imagine spending winter with no glass in your windows? How about living way out in the middle of nowhere with no lock on the door? There are bears up here. <laughs> Would you like to head inside? Let's take a look. Take a look around. What do you notice? Not much to it, is there? A whole family would live in a place like this. You see one big bed. That's where the grown-ups would sleep. But where would you sleep? Well, in a small place like this, you would put kids just about anywhere to sleep for the night. How about a nice bedroll in front of the wood stove? That would be cozy. And it could be rolled up in the daytime and put out of the way. Let's see where else you could sleep. How about up in the loft with dried meat, coffee, and herbs? At least it would smell nice. Everyone in the family was expected to work on the homestead. If your family came up here to South Park to farm, it was a lot of work. Everyone would have to get up at sunrise to take care of the farm. Then, if there was a nearby school, it would be time to learn if you had finished all of your chores. Then after school, more chores. At the end of such a busy day, you probably wouldn't have any trouble falling asleep no matter where your bed was. From the Native Americans to fur trappers and from gold miners to homesteaders, Colorado's history is full of loss and riches, growth and expansion. I'm so glad that you could join us today for a visit. There are so many more buildings and stories here to explore. Maybe you can come see us in person sometime. We'd love to see you here on Front Street. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.